Hello and welcome back and that is right it's time for another before you buy the video where we talk about whether a NAS I've got here on the table is suitable for you and in today's video we are looking at this the new Synology 1522 Plus we did a full length hardware review at the end of June but in today's video we're going to keep things a great deal more snappier I'm going to give you five reasons why I think you should consider getting this for your data storage needs and five reasons why you might want to remain on the fence and maybe sit there and wait for another little sneaky four bay a DS2922, DS923, DS924, who knows? But let's focus on this. Let's begin. That is right, let's get the obvious one out of the way, DSM 7.1. Now, technically, DSM 7.1, Disk Station Manager 7, uh, is available on the majority of Synology NASes. So why exactly am I picking it out as a highlight for this system? Well, nice and simply, because this system can do all of it. Anything that DSM 7.1 is said it can do, anything that Synology tout real loudly that their systems can do with DSM 7, this has got it covered. You name it, the full collaboration suite of applications there, multimedia, multi-stage backup to local, remote, cloud, over the network to another NAS, you got it covered. Surveillance station, 40 cameras, two licenses included, bang, you saw it there. Virtualization, CPU inside there, run a couple of VMs, bosh, done. Docker, you name it, it can do it. This system can run anything that Synology can say as well has uh, synchronized with their C2 cloud platform and a number of different services there within each of the individual apps. Bottom line, whether you're utilizing it in the web browser or using many, many, many of the client applications from multimedia devices to mobile devices and desktop client tools, DSM 7.1 runs very, very well on the 1522 Plus. Digging just a little bit deeper there into DSM, we're gonna focus very specifically on storage because this device being a five bay there, you're already entering the world of specialized storage there, aren't you? You could have gone away with a two bay there and gone with a simple mirror, but you are looking at a system that's looking at your RAID 5s, your RAID 6s, or in other words, your systems where redundancy becomes increasingly important, while at the same time, thinking about performance. And in terms of this device, not only have you got access to those traditional RAID 5 and RAID 6, one and two disk redundancies, but you've also got access to Synology's hybrid RAID system, SHR, a RAID configuration that allows you to mix and match your drives. You can utilize drives of different capacities and merge them all into a kind of Franken RAID system there. Now, very few people are gonna do that on day one with this system, but some users might only populate a couple of bays that want to add drives later. Some people may fully populate on day one with four or six DB drives, but a few years from now as drives become more affordable, want to add 10, 16, 20 TB drives, whatever the future's got installed. Consequently, uh, the beauty of SHR is it allows you to include those larger drives. Now, traditional RAID configurations like 5 and 6 will not let you. Normal RAID configurations will class every drive as the capacity of the smallest available drive. So you could have a 1TB drive and four 10TB drives. It will see all of them as 1TB each. However, in the fluid RAID system that is SHR, what happens is it classes, all it needs to do is calculate what the largest drive available is calculates that parity, uh, sorry, that redundancy and adds up everything else. So if you have that same analogy of one 1TB one drive and four 10TB drives, the system would still need 10TB of redundancy, but you'd still have 31 terabytes rather than four terabytes with a one disk redund redundancy. And on top of that, DSM-7 and its storage manager also includes fast RAID rebuilding there, which allows you, if you have this system, say you had 40 TB of uh, capacity there, but you've only got 10 TB of actual data, in the event of a drive failing and introducing a new drive for a RAID rebuild, fast RAID allows you to only have to wait for the drive to build the areas of storage per disk that had data. So rather than a traditional RAID rebuilds and resyncs, we'll have to actually work on even the empty bits and space of data. In fast RAID, it just zeroes out where there was no data utilizing intelligent parity data. And again, that combined with BTRFS inside make this a very storage fluid system. And for such a compact NAS that is towing the line between home, prosumer, and SMB, small, medium business, this is a very well-equipped storage system with a number of different directions that you can take you and your data. 
Next up, hard drive compatibility. Synology in the first half of 2022 was getting something of a PR mm, dip in the pond, a little bit of mud on the tires. What they were going through was lots of people getting a little bit irked on their changes in policy with regards to hard drives in DSM 7 and 7.1. Some of their enterprise level systems like the 3622XS and the 2422 Plus arrived with hard drive, hard, hard drive, I should say, compatibility lists that lacked a number of hard drives other than their own. Indeed, 90 to 95% of the drives that were listed as compatible were Synology only and nothing more. And given there were larger hard drives in the market, faster hard drives and faster SSDs on the market, a number of users were not overly pleased with this change in support. Now, in the case of the DS1522, there are a lot more drives featured on that supported compatibility list there. There's Synology's own hard drives and SSD, but you've also got the WD Red series there, you've got your CA Ironwolf series, you've got dedicated surveillance drives on there, you've got data center drives as well. The range of drives is better than it was before, though I would argue there is still some emissions on there. There's nothing above 16 gig on there, uh, sorry, 16 TB on there, and there's still hard drives I'm surprised are not on there, but still nonetheless, is a much, 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 much wider compatibility listing for this system online, and therefore less of a slight hurdle down the line with regards to support in the event that you are trying to pursue any kind of uh, su um, support from the brand in case of a failure. That's right, another neat little bonus of this system is that it arrives with an option to add 10 GBE. There's a slot there that allows you to add a Synology 10 GBE connector there. So this five um, bay system there that's got uh, four LAN ports there can, you know, together in the right RAID, get some serious performance there, whether you're using hard drives or SSD. So a lot of users are not going to want any kind of bottleneck externally in their system. Now, there are 10 GBU Synology NASs out there, but they're quite, quite expensive. So the idea of going for this mid-range disk station, uh, disk station 5 bay and the ability to add 10 GBU later on adds a degree of future-proofing that previous, the previous two generations of 5 bay, and indeed the 4 and 2 bays that came before it, that you know it just wasn't there which is now opened the door to you there and the 10 gbe on this knocks around for about 150 quid so again you are paying for an upgrade it's not there on day one but it's nice to have that option down the line Now, this is something of a minor point there with regards to the memory, but I do think once you look at the previous generations of this 5 bay, it makes a lot more sense why I consider it a great reason to consider this NAS for faster storage uh, applications. And that's because it arrives not only with 8 gig of memory that can be upgraded to an impressive 32 gigabytes of memory on such a compact system, but it also arrives with ECC error correcting code or error code correction memory that allows data when it is passed through through that memory during write operations to be checked um, for any inconsistencies during the write operation at the beginning and end of the transfer using an extra module on the memory, which then, if there are inconsistencies, compares it against the shape of the data when it arrived in terms of its uh, design and architecture, you know, its binary, and then repairs it, self-healing memory. And it's an incredibly enterprise memory um, option, which I'm surprised Synology included in such a modest five-bay system there, something that Synology generally don't opt for. But it's not all good. There are reasons why you may not want to go for a system like this. Let me give you five reasons why you might want to leave this on the fence. Now, some may think me churlish or petty about this, but the fact this system still arrives with one gigabit Ethernet does underwhelm me a little bit. Yes, you've got the option of adding 10 GBE, but the fact that some obviously still persist on putting one gigabit Ethernet on their NASs still really surprises me, given that the majority of their competitors, and there are lots and lots and lots of switches and routers and even, you know, home user client hardware that is beginning to arrive with 2.5 GBE. Hell, wi wireless connections on Wi-Fi 6 and 6E are now exceeding the bandwidth of traditional wired Ethernet there at 1 gigabit, with some of them arriving between 1.2 and 2.4 
gigabits per second connectivity there and this still living on one gig on the bottom there then you've got the fact that internet connections are surpassing that of gigabit ethernet and therefore having an internal network that could potentially be slower than your external internet connection is barbaric now a lot of users have highlighted that 2.5 gbe is still by no means ubiquitous compared with 10 gbe or 1 gbe even though 10 gbe is more expensive however 2.5 GBE is being applied and a lot of people that are buying solutions like this have an element of future proofing to factor into their buying choice between three to five years. And yes, they can add 10 GBE there, but still adding one GBE on this default model in 2022, even if it is four ports that can be lagged up to four GBE, it's certainly going to put some users off. Next up, it is the NVMe SSD slot on the base of this system. Now, I've highlighted this before, and I still really like that Synology include M2 NVMe bays on their NASes. It's great for caching, read and write, caching them, performance of larger databases. I've done my own testing. I've done read and write testing. I've seen performance benefits from it. So I'm not anti the caching. I like the ports. So why is it in the pile of answers? Nice and simple. You can't use them for raw storage. And to me... I would like to be able to use Superfast NVMe on PCIe Gen 3 slots, which this thing is using, for raw storage ports. I don't like that I have to use them for caching. I'd like to be able to choose between caching and a raw storage access pool for those, whether it is to run VMs, run the system OS, run preset important applications, or simply so I can have a super fast access pool. If I add 10 gigabit Ethernet, I can use it for editing. Ow, that hurt my arm. Next up, we've got to talk about it, that CPU. I think it has to be said that CPU has divided opinion. Now, it is a good processor. And when it comes to file handling, and I believe this video is going to go out before my hard drive and SSD RAID 10G testing, the CPU does great file transfer speeds. Then. With SSDs, I was able to smash through that strange six to 700 megs that Synology highlighted on this system as that 10G performance. Yes, Bayes was with hard drives and mine with his SSDs, but still nonetheless, in terms of file transit and file handling, it's still very, very good. But when it comes to graphical handling, that CPU, it's not pushing my buttons. And a lot of users are going to be looking at this system in summer of 2022, because things like the 920 and stuff have now been around for two years or more, assuming this being a two years later new release will be better but when it comes to multimedia when it comes to some of those billy basic home processes it's going to be found quite wanting and also it's a dual core cpu yes it's got four threads so four virtual cpus for a, a vm but still a dual core ryzen embedded the v um sorry the r 1600 here for me i wish they'd gone with a more powerful Intel Celeron, maybe the J6412 or the N5105 like everyone else. But I understand that Synology's business model and their, um, their overall target demographic is changing. And I think this CPU in line with that change makes a lot of sense. But multimedia buyers, Plex Media server buyers, people that enjoy video station, enjoy the myriad of media applications that are a little bit more graphically oomphed. They are the ones that are going to be slightly less pleased about this CPU. These next two points are going to be a little bit me, and they are going to only be for a smaller area of people that are not going to be uh, going to be wondering about buying this now and its suitability for them. So again, these two rather minor; they probably don't affect anyone, but I have to at least acknowledge them because people do still highlight this. One USB support on Synology's DSM7 platform and the majority of their devices has um, kind of declined quite a great deal over the last few years. Not just the number of ports that are available, but the architecture and what you can do with them, the port on this system arrive as USB 3.2 Gen 1, so 5 gigabits per second, which given that USB 3.2 Gen 2 10 gigabit connectivity is a thing now, it really surprises me that they're still using the older Gen USB on this, which is slower. Second, uh, secondly, within DSM, 
there are far, far fewer things you can do with USB ports. There's one port on the front, one port on the back, and you can utilize it for an external storage drive, um, and you can utilize it for things like a UPS, but the range of supported USB peripherals has declined massively with things like USB dongles for network and Bluetooth not being available, uh, peripheral control devices no longer being supported, USB printers, USB scanners, that sort of stuff no longer being supported. And this is something we're seeing more and more with USB support being uh, just reduced all the time on Synology's platform there. And I still think there's a lot of users, whether they're using it for more than just a USB backup, that aren't overly keen on that, and particularly when these systems arrive with USB ports. And there are many, many, many USB to network adapters out there covering one, 2.5 and five gigabit uh, external connections. I believe the USB ports on these devices could be doing so much more. And finally, returning to the subject of that 10 gigabit Ethernet port, we have to touch on the way Synology have pursued 10 gigabit Ethernet upgrades on this and a few devices coming up, including the RS422. And that is that they're now utilizing a proprietary adapter, this one here, the E10G22T1 Mini. What a catchy name. Now, they do already have a 10 GBE upgrade card this one here. Now that's the E10G18T1. Again, names are getting catchier. Um, and this is a PCIe Gen 3 times 4 adapter. That's a lot of bandwidth for just a 10G card, but we've got a lovely great big heat sink there. And this card knocks around for about 139 to about 150 NICA, depending on where you shop around. It's not a cheap card, but it is a 10GB upgrade card that works on the majority of Synology NASs, at least up until now. Now this new card, takes advantage of a PCIe Gen 3 times 2 slot. Much more narrower there at the top. It's knocking around at the moment, again, between 140 and 150. So the price difference isn't enormous between the two of them, although availability is nowhere near as flush on the older one. But although I would argue the benefits in terms of installation are mind-bendingly easy, given that installing the 10G is just pop it in, rather than taking the chassis apart, installing a card and putting it back together again, a lot of users are not overly fond of this proprietary method. Also, the heatsink on board is quite small compared with the other, and a PCIe card in the chassis is going to have a lot more active airflow than that small little adapter there. We even ran a poll over on the YouTube channel, oh, this YouTube channel, I should say, uh, to get people's perception of it, and overall, though it was relatively close early on, it did seem that the more users were less keen on it but of course it, people are going to judge these things in a more loaded fashion the way the question is put to them but overall i know that people there are going to be users out there that are going to be less keen on this so if that sounds like something you don't, don't want to get involved with that may be another reason to sit on the fence but overall the 1522 for me is still a very good nas and outside of multimedia shortfalls and usb shortfalls I do like the 1522 NAS here. Outside of those USB shortfalls I mentioned earlier on, those NVMEs not being fully utilizable as storage pools, and the fact that the 10 GBE is not going to be to everyone's liking, and multimedia users maybe not getting the most out of it, I still think there are 10 times many reasons why this is still a great NAS to go for right now. Now, again, we've done a full review going into way more detail about this system linked in the description, along with a full review over on NAS Compares linked down there too. So do check that out. We're going to be doing a bunch of tests with this involving comparisons against the, its predecessors. We're going to be doing surveillance testing, Plex Media Server testing, MB and Video Station as well as comparisons with this CPU versus an Intel Celeron in different tasks to see which handles what better. So do stay tuned for that. But otherwise, if you have enjoyed this, click like. If you want to learn more and stay tuned and know when these other videos are going live, click subscribe. Use the links in the description to the articles I've highlighted as well as buy links and donation buttons if you would like to help me keep the lights on here at NAS Compares. And finally, there is the free advice section linked below where me and Eddie the web guy will help you choose the right data storage solution for you. But otherwise, thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.